Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project delivered to you by Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Ukraine Catholic University's Analytical Center, and NGO EuroAtlantic Course. My name is Alexandra Tsikhanovska. I'm the head of Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group at Ukraine Crisis Media Center. And today we talk once more about the issue of utmost importance, that is, what made February 24th possible. More than one month of Russian large-scale invasion of Ukraine is already behind us. And in 34 days, more than 140 children have been killed, as well as 4,500 residential buildings destroyed, as well as 150 health facilities and 400 educational facilities. And not to mention the numerous losses in civilian and industrial infrastructure. There is a recurring argument that this level of destruction uh, and violence is the sole responsibility of Vladimir Putin and the narrow circle of Russian elite. And while Putin, as well as all those involved in, in implementing the criminal orders and that are often accompanied by violence and brutality that completely violate the rules of war, this destruction is enabled uh, by the deeply colonial perception of Ukraine that is shared by so many in the Russian society. This perception was coupled with the years of dehumanizing propaganda, which still was not the only source of information available to the Russians that should not be infantilized for their choices. And these choices all too often fit in the framework of the Ruski Mir quasi ideology that denies the existence of Ukraine as a sovereign nation and justifies elimination of all those who do not agree to see Ukraine as a territory, not a state, under full control of Moscow. The Ruski Mir has three key characteristics, which are uh, the leading role of Russian Orthodox Church, uh, which along with its proxies, for example, Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine has been actively used as a tool of hybrid warfare. Uh, the second component is Russian language. And note here that the State Duma in Russia is getting ready to vote on a bill that will recognize all the Russian speakers, regardless of their location and the state of their citizenship, as Russian compatriots, which will give Russia even more leverage to protect their interests abroad. And finally, the historical leading role of Russia among the Slavic brotherly nations. And hence, we can remember the articles written by Putin on the unity of Russians and the Ukrainians. War of aggression cannot be carried out with the will of one man. And in case with Russia, territorial aggression has repeatedly resulted in a spike of support for the ruling regime. So today we talk about these realities, as uncomfortable as they may be. And we start with a famous journalist, documentalist, and writer, Yuri Makarov, who explores the collective solidarity and collective responsibility uh, in depth comparing Ukrainian and Russian societies. Hello, my name is Yuri Makarov. I'm a journalist, producer, former radio and television host, or not former, who knows. But now I can observe with my own eyes what collective solidarity is, how it is when people take responsibility for the future of their country. I observed the same thing on the key of Maidan eight years ago when the collective will of the almost whole nation was concentrated in the denial of an unacceptable civilizational choice. I know the concept of collective responsibility is not in trend today, but if there is collective heroism, collective courage, collective empathy, why not talk about that too? Now, when the cards are open, certain representatives of the Russian elites are speaking out against the war, but they do it so timidly, so hesitantly, so carefully avoiding the words war, Putin, Ukraine. Only a few, literally a few, honest, decent, open-minded Russians can call a cat a cat, including admitting their part of the responsibility for the tragic events. 
they are tragic not only for Ukrainians and potentially all of Europe or all human civilization, but also for Russia itself, its future, its next generations. The simplest thing is to reassure yourself, okay, it's not the Russians. The Russians are not to blame. It's all Putin. Well, maybe some uh, persons uh, around him, some uh, from the military-industrial complex, uh, a few propagandists, a few oligarchs. Alas, I am a Russian and a Russian-speaking citizen of Ukraine and a Ukrainian patriot. I have a right to my own opinion because I know modern Russia quite well, at least until 2014, and I personally know many representatives of the Moscow elite. I also talked a lot with representatives of the so-called ordinary people. I can testify that almost all of them are somehow involved in the current crime against humanity including even those who today actively oppose the Russian regime from Berlin, from Munich, London, Vienna, New York, Prague. They had a hand in the creation of this construction in the past. As for those very ordinary people, sadly, Russian sociology can hardly be trusted at all, but today its data, in my opinion, are very close to the truth. Maybe not 71 or 68, but the huge majority of Russians supports the war. This is also confirmed by the transcripts of the conversations of captured Russian soldiers and officers when they call to their relatives in Russia. Whether they can be published is another question, but no, it's not up to privacy. What is the reason? You can argue for a long, long time, perhaps the lack of habit of democracy, or distrust of foreigners, or a long totalitarian past that had not been properly reflected on, perhaps the result of propaganda. Perhaps, perhaps such is the cultural tradition. Or perhaps there is social contract that Putin and the so-called elites concluded with their people 20 years ago. You do not prevent us from enriching ourselves and asserting ourselves. We allow you to steal crumbs from our table and feel pride in the power of our country. There are enemies around us, but everyone is afraid of us. Long live Putin. There have been cases in history when entire people or significant part of these people got lost in history. They had to be treated, they were helped to see clearly. Sooner or later, this will have been done with the Russians as well. Just as a Russian, I will allow myself such a generalization. But already today, it is possible to deprive the psychological comfort of opportunists and demagogues. There is no need to feel sorry for them, no need to say that they are also victims of Putin, not also. They are not the same. A Russian oligarch who had, has nothing to pay a gardener in London, and my sister-in-law, who miraculously escaped from Mariupol, and she now she's in Poland with uh, her two children and her husband. They spent two weeks in the basement under the bombs 
and they were drinking water from the heating system. The conductor of the Moscow Court Orchestra, whose contract was not renewed somewhere in Vienna or Amsterdam, and the parents of my acquaintance conductor from Lviv, killed in the town of Irpin. They are not the same. My tolerance doesn't go so far. But that's not all. Until the whole of Russia realizes its responsibility for crimes against humanity, until the last Russian stops believing that the death of Ukrainians are just an opportunity to pay off the mortgage and spend their holidays in Egypt, everything will continue, and sooner or later the monkey with the grenade will detonate his nuclear grenade, and then it will be too late to talk about responsibility. You don't like the concept of collective responsibility? Okay, let there be personal responsibility. So, even better. Next, we welcome Mr. Lech Pokarchuk, a military and psychological operations expert who discusses the role of Russian elites and the general ideological framework of Putin's totalitarianism. And this is not an authoritarian regime, but a totalitarian one. And I think Hannah Arendt would agree here. What factors in the Russian society make it so susceptible to propaganda, including dehumanization of Ukrainians and justification of war? Let's find out. I'm Oleg Pokarchuk, I'm a military psychologist and uh, psyops expert. Russians are under pressure of sanctions, yet 70% support Russian, Ra Putin's regime. This trend will prevail. How did the average Russians end up in such a conflict cognitive position? Why is Putin's power still real to them? This is a wrong question. The Russians are not under sanctions. The economy of the Russian state is under sanctions. This economy is concentrated personally in the hands of Putin and his hunt of Russian oligarchs. This economy has been developing for over 20 years with the active financial support of Western countries. Now that support is gone, Putin sees this only as a serious conflict between former business partners who are now deceiving him and Russians. And the Russian government has been and remains convinced that talking about human rights and the values of a free world is simply demagoguery for the benefit of business. To make it easier to understand the population of Russia, it has in the same way as the population of the Soviet Union. Putin has given them back this type of self-identification, and they gladly accept him. They renounced freedom in exchange for stability. The quality of this stability does not matter to them. Apart from Moscow and St. Petersburg, the rest of the population lives in a great poverty and knows no other reality. They vote will and life circumstances are not traumatic for them. Yeah. Putin's power over them is based on a cult of personality that has been going on for 20 years. This is a role model that combines images of an Eastern monarch and a tribal leader. This, there is nothing European about it, which is um, why it seems so amazing to Europeans and Americans. Such were Muammar Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein. What is it like to be a citizen of an authoritarian state like Russia, North Korea, Nazi Germany? Is this comparison valid? What protective mechanisms are at work and can they be switched off? How long will it take? Well, at the beginning of European history, all states were authoritarian. Democracy, as we understand it today, is a very young phenomenon in terms of history. The authoritarian countries we have mentioned have one thing in common. Despite all their cultural differences, they reconstruct the past. They speak of the strengths and greatness of their countries, which frighten the whole world with their very name. The basis for supporting totalitarian regimes, and Putin regime is totalitarian, not authoritarian, is such a pleasant feeling that the whole world is afraid of you. You are nobody and everyone is afraid of you. So you gained power and authority over the whole world without any effort, just supported the, his favorite tyrant. And how not to love a person who just gave you high self-esteem? Putin is often compared to Hitler. Yeah, there are many similarities in propaganda and motivation. But while Hitler and Himmler cultivated a lack of conscious 
in the SS and Gestapo in the first place. Putin obliged all of Russia to speak out and behave like the SS and Gestapo at the same time. This will last as long as it lasted in the Soviet Union. This is a very long time. There are two or three completely lost generations. Future cooperation is possible only with young people, and it will not be easy. Remember what social difficulties arose and still exist in Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall. What reasoning and emotions can justify a nuclear strike for Russia's leadership? What can stop this spiral of violence? This is the possibility of a nuclear strike for Putin is an integral part of his reputation in Russian society, as was the case with the leaders of the Soviet Union. He is not interested in a world in which Russia does not rule the world according to its rules. In this paranoia, he is really very similar to Stalin and Hitler. He does not believe that the West may not be afraid of him. It can only be stopped by a demonstration of force, as Khrushchev was stopped, during the Caribbean crisis. Thank you. Our next speaker, Olga Tokaryuk, a great independent journalist, particularly famous for dismantling Russian propaganda in the case of Ukraine National Guard soldier Vitaly Markiev, shares her thoughts on why psychologically so many Russians either dismiss this war or openly support it. Hello, my name is Olga Tokaryuk. I'm an independent journalist. And uh, I want to share some of my thoughts on why the war against Ukraine is not just Putin's war, but it is actually Russia's war, and uh, why, in fact, a lot of Russians seem to support this war, or at least not to oppose it. Well, you know, the, there are polls that indicate that about 70% of Russians actually support this war. We have, of course, be cautious uh, with the, the poll results in Russia. But it is an undeniable fact, and we are hearing that also from the interviews with mothers of the killed Russian soldiers in Ukraine, that uh, a lot of people in Russia support this war, and they think that uh, Russian soldiers are fighting for a just cause, for uh, protecting, actually, Russia from a, an attack from Ukraine or an attack of the West. So people in Russia, many of them, they actually believe the propaganda they hear, and uh, despite all the evidence and despite you know even the videos and and photos and information sent uh, to them by their friends and relatives in Ukraine, many of Russia, many Russians, uh, you know, try just they dismiss the videos and the evidence they are receiving from people on the ground in Ukraine as fakes. They are saying these are staged uh, videos or that Ukrainians are bombing themselves. So very often it is a choice, actually. It's not that they are blinded by propaganda. They do not have like sources, other sources of information. Very often they do have other sources of information, but they prefer uh, not to, uh, you know, believe the, the truth and instead believe the propaganda because it's easier. And actually some of Russian citizens uh, are living abroad and academics, they were talking about this, that... Uh, you know, a, a lot of Russians actually, while knowing in fact what is happening, they prefer to turn a blind eye to it because it is easier for them psychologically as well. Because if they accept that their uh, government and their military is committing terrible war crimes, atrocities in Ukraine, kills civilians, uh, kills uh, pregnant women and children, then somehow they have to react. But if they say, well, we don't believe it, it's not happening then it's okay. And somehow, like, they can remain, uh, you know, um, indifferent and not to do anything with that. So for many, it's a matter, actually, of choice that justifies their own lack of uh, action and indifference. But what is the most striking, I think, uh, is that so many Russians abroad uh, seem to, you know, also support this war and, and believe in all the fairy tales and outright lies about, uh, you know, Nazis in Ukraine or the need to denazify or demilitarize Ukraine, like complete made up claims by by Putin and his entourage. And we've seen, uh, uh, you know, these Russians taken to the streets in uh, in the Western European countries, such as Germany and Switzerland, where, you know, uh, Russian citizens who have been living in these countries for many years, and some of them might already have the citizenship of this country, so they are of Russian heritage, but they might be citizens of Germany, of Switzerland. And they go out on the streets with Russian flags, with the Soviet Union flags, 
with the Z signs, you know, with the war criminal signs in support of this war. This is, I think, the most striking. And those people, you cannot say that they do not have access of inf to information or they are living in an information bubble or that they risk uh, personal uh, freedom if they, uh, you know, oppose this war. So living in a free democratic societies of the West, these Russians or people of Russian heritage, they support the imperialist, cruel, atrocious war that, uh, you know, uh, Russian state conducts in Ukraine. And this can only be explained by, you know, one thing, that so many Russians still have an imperialistic colonial attitude to Ukraine. They consider Ukrainians somehow lower people, inferior people that have to be subjugated, and they deny the right of Ukraine to exist as an independent and a sovereign state. So many Russians share this uh, opinion, and even some of those who call themselves liberals. So please do not uh, confuse this war, or, you know, do not call it Putin's war. This is Russia's war, uh, supported by Russians both inside and outside Russia. Our next guest, uh, Mr. Ihar Todorov, gives a more academic and yet a very passionate perspective on the differences of legal and moral responsibility and how the latter is highly essential for truly stopping the war. He addresses the mistaken framework in which the majority of Russians are against the war and love Ukraine. Let's listen to what he has to say. Шановні друзі, хотів би висловити власне міркування стосовно відповідальності, колективної відповідальності росіян за те, що коїться з нашою країною, що вони коять тут. Звісно, відповідальність буває різна. Юридична відповідальність завжди індивідуальна. Тобто мають бути притягнуті до кримінальної відповідальності кремлівське керівництво, ті російські військові, які коять злочини, які нищать українських людей, українські міста – і села, але існує ще і моральна політична відповідальність, так само як з Німеччиною. Після Другої світової війни існувала саме така колективна відповідальність німців за злочини, скоєнні нацистами. Нагадаю, що канцлер Віллі Брандт неодноразово публічно просив вибачення за те, що зробили німці під час Другої світової війни. При тому сам особисто він був учасником антинацистського руху. Скажу відверто, що в мене особисто теж існувала така ілюзія стосовно Словно того, що кремлівське керівництво, Путін погані, а ось російський народ, він такий добрий, хороший, любить Україну і таке інше. Ці ілюзії я особисто позбавився в 2014 році, коли було окуповане моє рідне місто, коли був анексований Крим, ну і розпочалася оця війна, яка триває вже дев'ятий рік, і ось останні тижні у вигляді такої відвертої агресії на всю Україну. Стосовно відповідальності конкретних росіян, я б сказав, що повністю згодний з думкою моєї колишньої колежанки, професорки, письменниці Олени Стяжкиної. В 16-му році вона заявила, що до росіянина треба ставитися одразу як до ворога, поки він не довів зворотнього. Причому я б до цього додав, що не довів цього не словами, а справами. Отже, насправді те, що Росію керує вже 22 роки Путін, є певним відзеркаленням того, що російський так званий національний лідер дуже чітко витеркалює ґрунтовні, безсвідомі засади російської людини. І про це свідчить масова підтримка його маячні відносно України, підтримка цієї так званої операції, фактично вторгнення і нищення України і українців. І, на жаль, поки що якихось... Ознак того, що в Росії місцеві мешканці змінять свою таку позицію, не спостерігається. Тому я вважаю, що відповідальність має бути саме колективна за усі ці злочини. Слава Україні! 
Let's welcome Irina Ehelson, a social uh, conflict psychologist and a dear friend who talks about the individual responsibility for committing the war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the support behind those crimes, the numbers behind such support, and how both issues have to be addressed. Is it only Putin, but not Russia, to be blamed and punished for the war in Ukraine? Or what does all this have to do with regular people? First of all, we should distinguish violation of humanitarian law, committing of war crimes, crimes against humanity from the collective responsibility for the support of war and crimes. Accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity, such as intentional killing of civilians, unlawful unnecessarily destroying of civilian property, wartime sexual violence, looting, unlawful deportation or transfer of civilians. This kind of accountability is personal. Though it is not only Putin or Shoigu, the Minister of Defense of Russia, but every commander or combatant who committed such crimes or carried out the criminal order around uh, under this accountability. International humanitarian law affirms the individual criminal responsibility of the different hierarchical actors involved in armed conflict. It must be proved in international criminal court. But politicians, journalists who inspired war crimes with public appeals and propaganda also should be brought to the tribunal, like it was an international criminal tribunal for Rwanda, for example. But what about civic responsibility of Russian citizens? Does it exist? According to a survey of Russian Public Opinion Research Center, 71% of Russians support the war in Ukraine. According to the CNN poll that was published a day before the large-scale invasion, 50% of Russians believe it's appropriate to use military force to keep Ukraine from joining NATO. 36% uh, of uh, the respondents, and in terms of the population, it's about 50 million of citizens, said that it would be right to use military force against Ukraine to join it to Russia. So this is 50 millions of the population who see the force usable to force one country to join another country, independent country. Among those who publicly support war are many officials and public personalities, but not only politicians. These are actors, singers, sportsmen, are bloggers, influencers of different kinds. Yes, the US Russia is a democratic country and Putin was elected as a president by a majority of the population. Even though this is not a real democratic country, the civic responsibility is defined as responsibility responsibility of a citizen. There are citizens in Russian Federation, so we, we will say there is a responsibility of the citizens. It is comprised of actions and attitudes associated with democratic governance and social participation. Civic responsibility can include participation in government, church, volunteers and memberships in voluntary associations. Actions of civilian responsibility can be displayed in advocacy for various causes such as political, economic, civil, environmental or quality of life issues. But the protest when your country, your government does something wrong is also a part of civic responsibility. Like it was in US when the protests against war in Vietnam took place in 60s and 70s, where citizens learned the value of expressing civic responsibility through civil disobedience. People relied on each other in order to correct injustice and achieve greatness in the nation. So the absence of such actions is also a part of civic responsibility. At the moment, we observe the kind of social contract that allows Kremlin to use aggression for its purposes. The question is, what kind of reparation should Russian society pay for the supporting of this war and these crimes? What would be the fair remedy in repair that would be relevant. What would we expect as just repair for not opposing the war or support war crimes with the deeds of different social actors? For the teachers from kindergartens to universities who teach that war is justified, the priests who call to sacralize this war, the journalists who spread fakes about war and about Ukraine. Authorities in the regions who hide the real numbers of deaths and don't take back dead bodies from Ukraine. For all those attempts to legitimize the war and atrocities to the other parts of the Russian population. Another important thing is what without call for the collective responsibility and reparations implementation, we can hardly expect an appearance of incentives for change among all these people in Russia. We can hardly expect an appearance of the basis for institutional reform for the prevention of such invasions in future.
You've been watching the episode of Ukrainian Flames, a special project made by Ukraine Crisis Media Center, Ukraine Catholic University's Analytical Center, and NGO Euro Atlantic Course. In the description to this video, you can find information on how you personally can help Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. If you find our job useful, please like and share this video, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. While you do that, remember that everything is going to be Ukraine.